special announcements. So at this time, our pastor has something he wants to share. Every once in a while I do something a little differently. And uh, because it was different in the early service, I forgot to do it differently. Uh, but I'm going to do it differently here so you get to be special. So, uh, in addition to the first and second readings of Scripture that our liturgists will be doing, um, I'm going to be doing a pastor's reading of Scripture uh, for the purpose of breaking up our uh, longer than usual Old Testament passage. So, I'm going to share with you from Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. And then Joel, not, did I say Joel? No, Job. 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 And then Job chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. There is more in between the two, but the likeness of the two and the significance of that is going to be highlighted in this reading. Job 1, 6 through 12. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered to the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant, Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan replied, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Now to chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you come? Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity. Though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and afflicted Job. This is chapter 2 of Job, verses 1 through 6. All right, let's stand and sing a, old, a good oldie, and that's victory in peace. <clears throat> Shall we sing? I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me. With his redeeming blood, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. 
I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. I invite you to join together in remembering the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from sin. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You notice I said sin instead of evil? Yeah. So that reminded me, I'm, uh, one of these days we'll have a uh, paraphrase version of the King James Version. Uh, if, when you read this, this prayer in different translations, more modern translations, you'll see that there's a, a, a more modern way to say the same thing. You want to make sure that you don't get one, a publication that is changing the meaning on things. But, uh, but when I pray by myself, I do uh, the, the, that prayer in my English, today's English. And uh, so I was just kind of in the in the moment and made that made that change. So hope I didn't confuse anybody. One of these days we'll go ahead and print my my personal way of doing it, uh, of saying it, and uh, and we'll see if from time to time when that gets placed in, if that helps you to have your personal way of saying the same truth. Uh, let's go to our heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we thank you for bringing us together, bringing us into your presence. And uh, Lord, we don't, don't presume to invoke your presence with us. We invoke that you would pull us into your presence. For we know that you were here before we walked in. You'll be here when we leave because you are everywhere at every moment. And particularly wherever we, uh, wherever we are when we need you. And so we come before you with asking that as you draw us into your presence with the hymns that we sing, with the words of your holy scriptures that we read, um, with the prayers that we pour out to you from our hearts and our minds and in times of silence and in prayers that we share on, on the prayer request cards, we ask, Father, that in the midst of all of this, and in particularly 
as we uh, read the scriptures and hear the, the expounded upon with the, the hope that, that the words that the preacher shares will speak to our hearts and minds in the places where we are at the moment for the things that we need to hear and understand that your word is speaking to us by your Holy Spirit speaking to us in our hearts and minds. We give you praise in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that's coming to you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the, in the face of suffering, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance, and you've seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a, simply, is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Whoops. Okay. Let us say our affirmation of faith on the inside. It's from 1 Timothy. Please stand together. <clears throat> there is one God, there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, and taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Okay, this time we will thank you, maybe see. Um, we will receive our prayer cards and offerings. Yes, we are. Oh, yes. sorry, we're going to sing now. You can stand up again if you want to. Let's <laughs> wait. Heavenly Father, we bring these gifts to you with an expectation in gratitude for the blessings that you have provided in our personal homes and in our community. Uh, through this church, we ask that you would continue to guide and direct us as, uh, as these monies go towards the ministry that takes place on our campus and, uh, and, and across uh, Hernando County and into the world. We pray in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 Shall we sing? Walking in sunlight all of my journey, over the mountains, through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, fly my soul with glory divine. Alleluia, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. 
Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in Him is no darkness, ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, fly my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above. Singing His praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises. Jesus is mine. If our voices don't wear out. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Let's do our um, praise. Oh yeah, praise, praise God, God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy. All right, our second scripture reading, again, is from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to start this morning with uh, uh, some of the prayer praises, and uh, then I, we have another request that I'll add some praise to prayer as well. Uh, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we thank you for this gift of prayer, that we can at any time just talk with you. We can talk with you about what's going on in our day and, and ask what you would have us to be about during this day. How would you want to use me today? Where do you want me to change my plans to go somewhere else? You are there when we cry out to you because of things that we are hurting for. We are there when you, you cry, we cry out to us 
but when we cry out to you in concern for what's going to take place. And we thank you, Father, for the blessings that we experience. And so I join with Elaine in a prayer of praise. As Jim, her husband, has just recently had his last treatment. And uh, his numbers were good. And that's, that is exciting and good news. And we thank you, Father, that uh, for, for this good news from the doctors. We ask that you continue to protect his body that there will not be a recurrence and that you keep him healthy and safe. But I also pray, Father, that you will um, shine light on opportunities uh, for Jim to, to be able to uh, give you praise and honor and glory and uh, to be able to find opportunities to express your goodness and, and your blessings. And uh, also with Elaine, and we look up to you, um, uh, a dear uh, older lady of 76 that is in need of our prayers because of a, a knee surgery. We ask, Father, that you guide and direct the doctors. You cause her body to heal as you um, amazingly, in an amazing way that you've designed us. Protect her from infection and help her to recover that uh, it may even be considered a miraculous recovery at her age and there will be opportunities for witness there. And then uh, also for um, a friend of Mary's family um, that is, uh, and Mary's asking that we would lift up prayers for all of that family, um, a person that is also named Mary for some of the struggles that that family is going through. With Robert, um, we lift up a praise that Becky Wilson is recovering from her cancer surgery. We ask that you continue to protect her from any further spread, and that she too may witness and have opportunity to share how good you have been in your blessings throughout that time uh, for her. And someone didn't, uh, this last one wasn't, uh, didn't have a name on it, but it's uh, something that's applicable for us. Let's, Father, we do lift up to you all of the de deputies of our sheriff's department here in the county um, that we have opportunities to meet as they come to some of our events. Father, we are grateful for their presence with us on Sunday morning to help us to be safe as we come walking across the road. Uh, to slow down the traffic. And especially in this season of holiday, uh, as people are traveling from place to place, uh, sometimes on uh, long journeys, but even when we're just going from our home to, uh, to into town, um, we, we need your safety and travel. And so, Father, often the deputies are seeing, dealing with people and, and seeing families when there in some of the most tragic accidents. And we know, we, we recognize, Father, that, that this touches their hearts and stays in their minds as well. We ask for your blessings to be poured out upon them, that as they do their jobs, uh, you will provide healing for their hearts and um, a soothing of, of their uh, emotions and compassion. Uh, bring safety to each of the deputies that uh, do come here on a regular basis to be with us. And we are, are grateful, Lord, for, for the opportunity that we have to say thank you for your service and for the, the, uh, the blessing that they are in many ways. We ask all of these prayers, Lord, knowing that though you know what we need to pray about before we ever do, um, you know our hearts, you know our minds, um, but we're grateful that you let us know that we are able to speak to you out loud or just silently in our minds with confidence that you hear and that you respond. And in so doing, it strengthens us in our, in our uh, sense of your constant presence and our faith and our hope. And, and so we give you thanks once again for this 
gift of prayer. That you tell us that we, if we will follow in the way that you will lead us, then you will be our God and we will be your people. And uh, through Jesus we learn that we can become more and more sons of God as we become less and less sons and daughters of this world. Amen. If you'd like to stand, please, for number 63 in the little blue book at Calvary. Shall we sing? Years of good humanity and pride, care not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I served. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Amen. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, maybe Steve. Good morning, Father. Thank you for this glorious day. Thank you for the opportunity to come together and praise you and worship you. And give thanks to you, Lord, for all of your many blessings. Today, Father, I give you special thanks for our pastor. You have given us a godly man who preaches your word to help us divine the message and the plan that you have for our lives, that we can turn to you for comfort and solace and understanding of what the world means and, and how to deal with everything that's going on. Lord, we ask you to bless Pastor Frank and Valerie and their children, grandchildren. Lift them up, Lord, hold them close. Give him the words that you would have him say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's optional up to mom. Okay. Thank you, Valor. Should be. Don't know. And they they promised me one side of the ch children's room would be open. Um. There, hey, Valor. There's always a. Uh, Classroom at the very end of the hall with tables. Meeting room.
So I know that when, while we were uh, preparing for the bazaar, our, our nursery became a container for <laughs> staging. Um, I went in there before the, 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 the bazaar and I was impressed that it was a very systematic staging area. Uh, so I was just hoping that that's still available, but there's plenty of rooms over right behind us here. So. so the thing that was a little bit different this morning in the, the way of uh, reading the scriptures is uh, that uh, I put together those two invitations that God extended to Satan. You know, just before I... Uh, Came down here, I, you know how you catch a little bug that you see flying in the eye, and my eyes caught and focused on it, came toward me and then went away, and I was able to make out by the way it's flying in the shape uh, as it was close, and it was a little tiny, actually it was kind of a big fat mosquito, okay? Not a skinny one, looks like it, it's been having plenty to nibble on, and as I saw the sort of wandering way that mosquitoes move around, um, I, I was reminded of the passage that I read here uh, when Satan was asked, uh, so where have you been, Satan? And uh, his answer was, uh, let's see, find the first one, find the first one. Hey, Satan answered, um, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And you know the mosquitoes flying around in your house and you see it and then you see it and it's like going back and forth looking for a place to land and suck your blood. <laughs> you know, going back and forth on it. I thought about that. Um, and uh, of course we have the image of Satan being a snake, a serpent slithering on his belly. Um, he's Images can be literal, um, and I know a lot of the images in the scriptures are very much literal, and, and then sometimes they can be representative to help us to understand um, the, the character and the, uh, and the person of, of uh, what's taking place. Sometimes it's some uh, figurative speech for us to be able to understand ourselves as well. Um, but I'm going to start here in the reading from um, 1 James, and we'll go back and forth a little bit in, in uh, addressing the passages in Job. Uh, but one of the things that, jump, that really jumps out at me that has, had bothered me a lot when I was young is that, uh, you know, when all of the angels come to give, uh, give honor to, to God, like when the kingdom has times for all the nobility to come in and the higher-ups and author authorities of the kingdom and to pay homage to the king. Oh, the great king and bowing and that kind of thing, maybe bring some gifts and stuff uh, to be introduced and, and to acknowledge his place and our place. And in both of these instances, God says, as Satan comes, like the other angels, and, and by the way, he's a fallen angel, yet he still has to come and bow before the Lord. I think that's a pretty intriguing part. He has to show up for roll call. And he says, God says, have you considered my servant Job? I remember as a boy, after I heard the story, and then when I hear this part read, and I think, don't say that. Why did he say that? And uh, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright and a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan took the bait. He said, well, of course he's, you know, a godly man. You, you've taken such good care of him, of course. This is all the stuff he blessed him with. And then God goes on to say, well, go ahead. You can mess with him. And as a boy, I, I used to really struggle with that. That why, why did God let Satan do that? And, and why did he bring it to him, his attention in the first place? And then after Satan goes off and causes all these terrible things to, to take, or Satan causes the terrible things to take place. We do have scripture that tells us God does not tempt us. Satan tempts us. God allows Satan. 
And, and, and both of these passages are a lesson in Satan can't do anything and doesn't have power for anything on this earth um, except that God allows it. God allows it. Because we're a broken world. And for that to be allowed uh, means that we truly get to have a choice, a decision on whether we want to trust God, follow God, be blessed by God, uh, be comforted by God when things take place. Whether, whether we want this relationship with Him or we don't, He gives us the choice. And in that choice, He allows Satan to be the prince of this world because this world's a broken world. This world has sin in it, and Satan is an integral part of that. But there will come a time when all of that sin is gone. But God has given us a unique opportunity to be able to come before Him and be in relationship with Him and be, to be changed, to be drawn out of this world and into His righteousness. And as he's doing that in our lives, he then also gives us a mission. And that is to reach out to other people to let them know that God is inviting them in to relationship with him so they can be better and better and better. And so then in the next part, uh, Satan comes uh, again when all of the angels come. And he, Satan's been off doing what he's doing. And, and God asks him, uh, this time, uh, where have you come from? And Satan answered, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Same answer. He's kind of like, hey, I get to go out there and trump all over your people. I get to see. I, I'm, I'm still doing it. I, I wonder, you know, Satan doesn't get to see the future and what's going to come. And I guess it hadn't occurred to him to read our Bibles. You know, or maybe for as far as he's concerned, it's a blank page. I don't know. Uh, but Satan, I believe, he really believes that he's going to win this battle every time he gets any of us to sin in any way. And he thinks he has a chance. We know how it ends because we have the scriptures that tells us how it ends. And we know on which side of that ending we can be on. So on this second time, Satan, uh, the Lord responded to Satan saying, have you considered my servant Job? And as a boy and as a young man, I'm thinking, no, why are you going to bring that up again? Hasn't he suffered enough? It was hard for me to, to, to feel okay about it all. There is no, and, and thus God says this about Job. He says, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So it's like a repeat of what happened before. And then it changes just a little bit. And he still maintains his integrity through it all. Though you incited me against him, to ruin him without any reason. God is saying, see, I told you. I don't know if God is offering a lesson to Satan in all this, because God hasn't yet eliminated all of evil. Whether Satan has a choice to come back to God or not, I don't know, but I've wondered that at times, and particularly like this. But clearly, it's a, it is a lesson for us to understand. And he says, and still maintains his integrity through though you incited me against him to ruin him up without any reason. And so Satan's response, you know, that part about skin for skin, a man will do anything to give up anything to save his life, that kind of thing. And then God, and, and of course, I don't, I don't know when was the first time I ever heard the story of Job. I, I'm sure I was very, very young. It's a story that will be told over and over again. But I, I would be thinking, oh, no, no, he's going to do worse. There's going to be worse. And so I want to take a moment to look a little bit at, uh, at James verses five, uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 12. And, uh, and that starts off 
Listen, you rich people. Now, as it goes through that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that um, we're poor people here. Um, life is so much better for us than so many people in so much of the world. But I wouldn't say that we're rich people either. Although I've known some rich people in my life, and I've, and I've uh, known them to be very respectful and, and some of godly people. I've seen some that are not so godly. Uh, but this, uh, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. I have to say, Marianne, that was a wonderful reading of this passage that was just the right amount of scolding, wasn't it? <laughs> wasn't it? And it was kind of real easy to say, boy, I'm glad I'm not one of those people. You know? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Um, a great thing about the scripture is that we'll find warnings and scoldings for those rich people. And then also we'll find warnings and scoldings for some people that are in poverty and, and, and not doing well. And a lot of times it's saying, well, it's because of how you've been li living your life. And then we find warnings and scoldings where we go, oh man, that's talking about me. <laughs> yep. And, and, and that's, that's a good thing. We're not left out. Um, and in fact, the warnings and scolding here are also, before it happens, you have an opportunity to start becoming different. So you're not one of those. Okay, And it's described here. Okay, the things like your your wealth has rotted, moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded, um, and then uh, it says their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. So what's that saying about the wealthy people? It's saying about the, the the rich people that are being scolded. Okay, is because of the way that you put all of your wealth. That that's what you're relying upon. That's what you're holding up. That's what's important to you. Now it's going to be gone. And as it is gone, that's what's dragging you down. Whereas there are some people who, who are, are able to create a lot of wealth in a business, and then the business fails. And then they start over and create wealth and jobs in the business, and the business fails. And they start over and create more wealth and jobs. And they're more focused upon, well, earning a living, giving other people jobs, uh, and making something that's worthwhile for the world and having a sense of satisfaction that I'm contributing. You know, those, those are good qualities. And sometimes they have to start over several times before they get all the right formula together. And it's a great uh, business and such. And there's a lot of people that, that really feel develop, de devoted to their employees and to the community around them. And it's a part of the wonderful blessings of life. I've known a lot of these people in different industries and in different businesses. And, um, and then I've known some that was making wealth in order to have power. I want as much wealth as I can have. If wealth doesn't satisfy. Okay, I want to have as much power as I can have. And, Power doesn't satisfy. And so, some of the things that are listed, the wages you fail to pay for your walker, your work, workers uh, are crying out against you. And then uh, and the cries have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. And you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence, and you have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. So the people that did the, uh, the planting and, the, and plowing and the, and the pulling up the weeds and, and the harvest, all of those workers, um, the owner of it all didn't care about any of that, just cared about the wealth. But then we have a contrast. Be patient then, brothers and sisters. So the first one was about you rich people and the ones that they stomped all over. But here it says, brothers and sisters. And well, it got repeated again and again and again. Let's see, I underlined it and made it bold. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so several times in these two short paragraphs. Uh, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits on the, for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. 
You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. Brothers and sisters, and in the New Testament, any time we're seeing a reference about brothers and sisters, that's talking about uh, in the faith. We become brothers and sisters in the faith. Now, that's very much New Testament, but, but actually the, the, the Hebrew people in the Old Testament times had the same kind of thing. Um, every older woman in the place that would be um, about the age of my mom, I would, I would call her mother. Every one of them would be my mother. And so I helped mother with this and I helped mother with that. Um, anybody about my age, the women would be my sister. You're my sister, you're my sister, you're my sister. Um, and uh, the ones that are much older, the women were to be considered grandmother. And we all, everybody in the community treats each of the older ladies as grandmother. That's within the faith of those who follow God uh, through the, the people of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and I miss somebody. Abraham, Isaac, David. Jacob, and Jacob's son, Israel. Oh, because Jacob became Israel. Anyway, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Okay. Um, so the Hebrew people had this sense of family and caring for everybody in the Hebrew community. And if somebody came from the outside, a, 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 a foreigner, they could come in and become a part of that family. And that's the same kind of design for we in the church. The people in the congregation where I worship become my family, my spiritual family. And, um, and, and stay in a place long enough, and it, it really becomes more than just that spiritual aspect of it. And, and so as well. Um, so I do want to go briefly to that part of Job verse, chapter 1, verses 13 through 19 that we did not read. Um, and, and in that, we see that in that first time that Satan came by and then went away, uh, Satan was blasting all the things he had, the servants and um, so on and so forth. Here it is. One day when Job's sons and daughters, so this is what takes place after Satan goes out to pick on him. His sons and daughters were fasting and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. A messenger came to Job and said, okay, if they were, oh, excuse me, I said fasting. They were feasting and drinking wine. Um, the feasts, it, it could have been they were just having a Thanksgiving party or a Christmas party, you know, that kind of uh, thing, or a celebration and stuff. But uh, both of those are kind of religious holidays for us. Um, but that people would have been having religious holidays where they celebrate various things and eat, uh, feasting and drinking wine was a part of that. Um, we do know that earlier uh, we were told that Job would go and give sacrifices for himself, but he also did, gave extra sacrifices on behalf of his children and grandchildren in case they were getting too busy and not really staying faithful with it. Okay? It's the kind of thing grandparents do, right? Um, uh, but... We haven't seen anything in that in, they were doing anything wrong. Uh, and so a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. And they put the servants into the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to let you know. So he had these herds of animals that were really making a wealthy man and, and, and were something... Uh, that made it a wealthy community. And then this tribe from another kingdom came and just stole them all and killed all the servants. Can you imagine somebody comes in and kills all of the people who work for you? And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Oh, man. 
fire from heaven. And what was it? I, I don't know. Was it a volcano erupted and, and, and blasted them? Was it um, a lightning storm? I don't know. But it was something Satan was doing. And they were killed. And then while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. And they put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. And when suddenly a mighty wind swept it from the desert and struck, or swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them, and they are all dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. That was terrible. All of those things that took place. And I confess to you that it wasn't until I was in seminary and studying more of this and more of that that I began to feel less of a sense of, why did you let that happen, God? Just because Satan's going around being obstinate. Why, why let that happen? And, uh, and I struggled with it a lot. And, and I thought, well, well then what, what happens next? Afterwards, then Satan, Satan comes and he makes Job sick and just all these terrible illnesses and things that are taking place. And why do you let that, all that happen to Job when Job was good? But all the way through it, Job remained faithful. All the way through it. Of the worst of the worst things that could possibly happen to all that he cared about, and then the worst of the worst that was happening to him through sickness. And then the people that are supposed to be his friends are coming in and saying, well, I have some advice for you. And one after the other after the other, when you're reading that, it's like, oh, just go away before you make me sick, you know, kind of thought. Um, but how does it end up? It ends up, had you considered, Doug, he still hasn't. Okay, and... and, and as you read it, you'll see. Somebody even says, why don't you just go ahead and curse God and die? Put an end to your misery. And Job's response is, you know, Lord, Lord's the one that gives, and the Lord's the one that takes away. I came into this world naked. I'll go out of it naked. But instead, God greatly blessed him again. I always would think, well, all this new family, that's wonderful, but he lost the old family. That's still going to hurt. It does. It still hurts. It's still a loss. But now that I'm getting old, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I have children, I have grandchildren, and uh, I hope I see some of the great grandchildren. Do I want to have more children? Um, no. <laughs> but I think if all of them had been dead, I would have been delighted to start over again. And. Uh, like Abraham and Sarah, there would be enough energy given by God that I could still be, you know, useful. Uh, so I want to go down to Job chapter 1, verse 20 to 22. Uh, wait, there's something for me to read first. Uh, so, oh, I did forget to tell you, James, the, the man that wrote the book of James, uh, I... A lot of times I thought it was, uh, you know, you had John with the Gospel of, of, of John, and he wrote the book of Revelation, and he has a, a brother, James. They were fishermen together. It's not him. It's, it's uh, James, one of the younger brothers of Jesus. Remember, Jesus had several brothers. Um, and uh, all of the early scholars attributed to James, the brother of Jesus, who, um, after uh, the... Uh, the Christians in Israel, I mean in Jerusalem and in, uh, the, the Decapolis and, and all over, well, Paul was going around killing people and running them up and stuff. And a lot of the disciples were being dispersed. But James remained, uh, the brother of Jesus, remained in Jerusalem. After the, the uh, resurrection of Jesus, James got very involved in um, following up with now, I remember the, the brothers and my, my mom showed up a couple times when Jesus would preach. And one of the times they're saying, uh, 
come Jesus, you need to rest. You're kind of going crazy on this, you know? Remember that? Um, but we see that they were in and out. And so they were kind of keeping tabs on what was going on, celebrating it. Of course, Mom had said, you know, Jesus is the anointed one to the brothers and stuff. Um, but, but once there was uh, the dispersion of the disciples, James ends up becoming more and more and more a leader. And he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Um, and so uh, the, these are passages that are written by James, the brother of Jesus, after the resurrection and after uh, the, a lot of the dispersion of the Christians. Um, so, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. See, persevering is important. And we can't persevere if we don't have to suffer and sometimes, I mean, if we don't have to struggle and sometimes suffer. That's perseverance. And so we, we can see through the stories of the prophets, there's great value in being one that's in a situation where we've had to suffer some for the Lord. I was thinking we were going to be having a whole lot more of suffering because of being followers of Jesus Christ. And now it looks like, whew, we might have some time of not. But then we saw that with the northern kingdom of Israel, times of being blessed by God because of following God. And then, and, and of Judea as well, times of being blessed by God because they were following God. But then an evil king came in, and the people that followed the evil king, and they let things in that would, should not have been in their life. And they excluded what should have been in their life, and it got worse and worse. Both the northern king and southern king. And they were blessed, and then they weren't. And they were blessed, and they weren't. I think I've been seeing that in our experience as well. I think we saw that in Rome and it's rise and it's fall. So how many times God is going to do that, I don't know, but there's instructions here for us. As you know, we count as blessed those who persevere. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen that the Lord finally brought about, or what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Now, it doesn't even have to be our whole community the whole state or country. It could be just our household where we're going to have times of struggle. Where we're going to have times of, of things not going well. Um, but we persevere with high expectation. Above all, brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. In other words, don't, don't hang on to saying, I swear to God, this is true. You know, um, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And let your, your walk with the Lord and your faith be sufficient uh, as a witness. If there's anyone among you in trouble, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone sick among you? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, whether it's illness sick or spiritually sick or emotionally sick because of brokenness. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed, saved, and delivered. The word healed is also in translated saved and also translated delivered. It's the same word in, in the Greek. It's the same word in Hebrew. Uh, but in what it's applied to on what you're being saved out of uh, or delivered out of or healed and made well out of is the only distinction. The prayer of a righteous person, man or woman, is powerful and effective.
So may God make it so. Amen. Okay, our last song. You know, I don't like saying last song. Our closing song. Let's be the tie that binds. Let's be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like.